Hello and welcome to my podcast. Do me a favor, subscribe to the John Kyrie Report wherever you get your podcast. You're watching on YouTube, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button. You can find us there as part of Empire Media. And don't forget, you can also now become a member by going to the YouTube page. Click on join. It'll give you three different tiers you can join. You're going to get all the same stuff from me if you don't become a member. But if you do, you're going to get a lot more. So shout out to Adam Lerner, Mike Stewart, and Blaine Bowling, who have become our first gold members. Much appreciated. We're going to give you content. You're going to get extra stuff, you know, private Zooms, some Q&As, um, de de depending on your tier. Check it out on the homepage, on the homepage of, for Empire Media and hit join, go there, all that good stuff. And don't forget, you can read my work on ESPN.com. In a minute, a couple of minutes, I'm going to get to my interview, my conversation with former Washington tight end Logan Paulson. We went over a lot of stuff, things that he would look for in a coach that he th feels is important moving forward. Also, we talk about the quarterbacks. We talk about Drake May. We talk a little bit about Jaden Daniels. Um, and we, you know, just all that good stuff with Logan and just a lot of stuff that I think is just really good insight from a former player about what matters in a locker room too, with the coaching situation and the importance of hiring the right staff, why that's so important from an ex player's perspective. It's kind of obvious, but I think the impact when you don't have it, what happens. So stay tuned for that in a minute, but first got to go over some stuff and it's down to two Seattle and Washington are the only teams now remaining who need to fill their head coaching vacancy. That means the Ben Johnson sweepstakes, if that's who Seattle wants, is down to two teams. So Seattle, now my understanding with Seattle, like they have interviewed Mike Kafka, Dan Quinn, Patrick Graham, Edgero Evero, and then Ben Johnson. Those I think are the ones that are still on their list. And of course, Washington, Raheem Morris now going to Atlanta so you can take him off the list. Others who have interviewed and or will the others are going to interview early next week would include uh, Dan Quinn still on that list. He's going to interview with also with again with Seattle, I believe, on Friday. And um, Aaron Glenn, sorry, I spaced out for a minute. Aaron Glenn, Mike McDonald, Anthony Weaver, and you know Bobby Sloak interviewed early in the week. Uh, Eric Bieniemy a couple weeks ago. Um, there's really some tears here. And, and Ben Johnson, you're going to put at the top. Again, I've told you all along, that's that's always been the expectation of the league is that Adam Peters would end up and the, and the commanders would end up hiring Ben Johnson. But you still got to go through the process because what you don't, what I don't know is what, what if he goes out to Seattle? Like if you, you're now choosing between these two organizations, if that's who the Seahawks want as well, but you're choosing between two situations where you have, one of the best GMs in the game and John Schneider and a guy that many, many respect who feel he could become a very good GM in Adam Peters. And then you have, you know, two, two good fan bases. Um, I think the ownership situation here is going to be a little bit more settled. We don't know what's going to happen with Seattle out there, but you know, all signs continue would continue to point to Johnson being here, but we'll see until that, until those, you know, T's are crossed and the I's are dotted. We'll see. Um, but again, they're going to, they're going to talk to all those guys. Like the lions, obviously the games this week, can't talk to them until next week in person. I would expect that the, those, those interviews with the four remaining, or I guess five remaining to interview again, cause it's Quinn, McDonald, Weaver, Johnson, and Glenn to take place early, early next week. So that way this process could be wrapped up. Listen, if Detroit loses and they really, and Ben Johnson's their guy, this thing could be wrapped up by Wednesday morning because there's no reason for it to go beyond then at the, at this point. And, you know, by this time in mean, a week from now, we could know who the coach is. If the lions win and the Ravens win, it's going to drag on for a little bit longer. Cause you're, there's, there's no way I could see them hiring somebody before they get to, to have a chance to, to hire Ben Johnson. Um, and then I think it was also telling that Atlanta and Carolina, both of whom interviewed Johnson went in different directions and, and it may be that Atlanta wanted to go Raheem Morris because he's a good fit. He's front, you know, you coached there before. Um, I think he's deserving of it. Dave Canales in Carolina. That's an, I think he could be a um, good hire for them, but I don't think they were ever going to attract a Ben Johnson. I know like people worry about, well, oh, they could just throw money at him. It's going to take more than that, because he's going to get a lot of money anywhere. It's going <clears> to, <throat> what people want is not just the money. They want a place where, you know, you can win because winning keeps you employed in this league. You can go and get the money. Maybe you get a few mil, few more million over here, 
but are you going to, is that a long-term success possibility or could you have a, you know, if you're going to, if you're a hot candidate, you want to go every person I've ever talked to in this, in who's been in that situation and, and they're, they're, whether it's them or the representatives would say the same thing, put yourself in the best situation. And Carolina was never going to be that. I don't care what kind of money threw of them short of him bringing in, you know, short of him giving the guy a billion dollars is you're not going to get them. So anyway, but it was telling that those guys went, that those teams went in different directions. Um, and now it's down to two. So again, by early next week, they will have talked to all these guys for the second interview, and then you can make your decision and then, you know, get, get this process moving forward. So that's it for me. There you go. Here's my conversation with former Washington tight end, Logan Paulson. All right, Logan. So still don't know who's going to be the coach here, but I want to start just kind of in general. We've talked a lot about Ben Johnson, obviously, yeah. you know, everybody has. There are other guys. So, but from your perspective, someone who's been in the room, you know, played for, you know, number of coaches, what's the quality that you would look for most in a coach? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. I think it's, there's a lot of stuff behind the scenes that I think become a big factor here, but I think kind of the main one is just like, it's, it's leadership and your ability to relate to people. I mean, is really what it comes down to. And I think that's one of the reasons why Sean McVay is such a dynamic head coach. And I think one of the reasons why he did so well at such an early age with the, uh, with the interview process, because I think he had the ability to relate to people, identify a commonality with people and just be himself. And I think when you look at Kyle, like when he was in San Francisco, that was one of the things he was working on and, and, and improved with. When you look at Dan Quinn, that's one of the things he was excellent at. I mean, he was just fantastic at building relationships with people, creating a positive work and fight, uh, environment, finding ways to motivate people to be excited about coming to the office every single day. So I think I think those are things that, you know that I really identify from coaches that I have a lot of respect for. Mike Shanahan, I think too. You know, I think it was a little bit different there. He had really dynamic coordinators, but again, a guy that had that kind of that leadership quality, the ability to relate to players um, at, at a high level and understand the player's plight, I think was another thing that Mike did at a really high level that was always fun to see. So I, I think it's that. It's the leadership, the ability to relate and motivate the, the talent on the roster. How hard? Because obviously, you know, coordinators usually get hired because they're, they're play calling accurate. Yeah. Like the better they are, how big a part should that be in a decision? Um, you know, if the guy's going to be calling plays as the head coach, I think it should be a big factor. Obviously, if they're going to be your head coach and the offensive play caller, I think that 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 becomes a big deal. But I really, you know, it's interesting. Like I was having a conversation with someone over the weekend that I have a lot of respect for about how special teams coach coaches as interim head coaches tend to do really well because they know how to speak to both sides of the football and they have to relate to kind of different levels of the roster in a way that other coordinators don't like as an offensive coordinator, you're, you're coming up with the game plan, you're teaching and you're installing kind of the details X's and O's. But in terms of a special teams coach, uh, coach it's really about establishing an identity and a motivation there. So I, I don't think it's a coincidence that some of these interim coaches who are special teams guys do a really good job of, of motivating the roster at a high level. And I think that shows you kind of the role of the head coach. It's not so much schematic. It's more that motivation, communicating with the guys. And, um, and so for me, the X's and O's, I would like that because I think that's important for the coach to understand that at a high level, but I don't think for the head coach, it's as important as I think a lot of, it's as important as a lot of people um, who aren't in the building think it is for the head coach. And the other thing is like hiring the staff. Yeah. What yeah, do you I mean, think, what, what, and what do you think are the, like what separates a guy from hiring good versus bad? I mean, I don't, and I don't know if there's a way that that might be a hard question to even answer, because, but it's like, that seems to make a huge difference. Yeah. And I think it's really, you know, on being like, think about good staffs I was a part of and, and good. So obviously like the coordinator is your, is your general as the head coach. Right. And so you need to make sure that that guy is a smart guy, a good communicator, good teacher. And I, I think you'll notice the, 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 the descriptive words I'm using are different for a head coach than they are for a coordinator, right? right? And I think the, with within the context of the offense, the reason, again, I go back to the special teams thing, the special teams coordinator, coordinator is the motivator, he's installing, he's doing the technical stuff, and he's doing kind of the the interpersonal stuff. With the with with a coordinator, an offensive coordinator, they're doing the tactical stuff, but the position coaches are doing the motivating, and they're doing kind of the, the boots on the ground teaching. So it really, if you think about it, 
it's a conduit for the whole offensive identity, right? And if if there's a break in one of those chains, like an electrical chain, electrical current, then the message isn't getting across, then the offense isn't going to execute the way you need it to, to go, or the defense for that matter. So I think it's really important for people just to understand that structure. Yes, you need a brilliant mind at the head coaching spot, and you need smart position coaches as well, but you really need people who understand the vision of the OC and then can get that communicated down the chain. So I think those, those hires... And the ability for those people to work together is, I don't want to say it's the most important part of the process, but it's extremely important. Like, I don't care how dynamic you are as a head coach. You don't have as much teeth as people think you do. It's really the coordinators and their relationship to the position coaches. And if you have strong coordinators and a strong identity on both sides of the football, you're going to be a good football team. And so that's where that that hiring process becomes so, so critical. I think Detroit's a prime example of that. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I think when you look at Detroit, and, and I, again, I think Dan Campbell is an excellent motivator. Uh, outwardly, you can see that, how he talks to the guys, all the stuff on Hard Knocks. You see how he speaks to that group. But he's he's done a good job of hiring coordinators that can communicate down. The position coaches there are very dynamic. And I, and I think that's the thing that that fans and, and fans of football need to understand is it's hard to know if a guy's going to be good in that role because you're projecting them much like you're doing it with talent in the draft. You're projecting, but I think whatever Dan Campbell did in terms of identifying those pieces, I thought was excellent because that whole staff, um, they just seem to have a very, a very in sync vision of who and what they want to be on both sides of the football. And as a team, are there, I know you and Craig Hoffman on the take command podcast have talked a lot about this. Is there another candidate that just says like, you know what, more people should be talking about this guy, or I'm intrigued by this guy. Yeah. I mean, I think obviously Ben Johnson's the guy that, that everyone, the name comes up all the time. Um, McDonald from Baltimore is another guy, but I, I, I don't think people should sleep on Dan Quinn. I really don't. Uh, Dan Quinn, Raheem Morris, like those guys are great at the things that I just described that are important for the head coaching position. They're great at building relationships. They're great at communicating. They're great at motivating and they're both smart football guys. So I think they kind of check all these boxes that people want to overlook. I think another guy that I have a lot of respect for is Frank Smith. Like he's a guy yeah. that kind of, again, checks some of those boxes. I think the OC down in Tampa Bay, I think is a guy that's an interesting candidate as well, but you know, I don't know if they've interviewed here or not. I'm not, I haven't kept up to date with all that stuff, but I think those are the types of guys that having, having worked with Frank, having worked with Dan, having worked with Raheem, understanding how they treat players, how they communicate with players and how they find the way to maximize the player through that process. I think is something that I want in a head coach. And I think the other thing that I love about those guys, all of them is they're great communicators and they work well in a team setting. And so I want my head coach to be able to go, to Adam Peters and say, this is what we're looking for. This is who we want to be. This is our identity and really have a clarity of vision about what that is. And I think all three of those guys, while they might not be the Ben Johnson or the, the McDonald's of this class um, are, are very, very, uh, I think adept at some of that, uh, some of that other stuff that uh, the head coaches need to do. When you're around a team that doesn't have that clear shared vision, yeah, how, how easy is it to spot and what's the result? Um, when you're in it, it feels very clear, you know, like when you're, when you're a part of it and you're playing for a team like that, it's, uh, it's extremely, extremely uncomfortable because you can tell like the, you, the position coaches will say, Oh, we're going to do it like this. And then in the meeting, the coordinator will be like, Hey, we're not doing it that way. And you look to the position coach and the position coach will look to the coordinator and you can just tell they're not communicating well, or you can also tell by the types of people that they're bringing into the organization. Hey, we're, we're a three, four. We need these big hulking five techniques, but you bring in a pass rushing three technique to play five. And that's just, there's, there's a, there's a disconnect from the GM to the coach. And then in the first example, there's a disconnect for, between the coach and the, uh, and the position coach. And I think like, that's where people need to understand. It's like a business, like, if you were going to run your business, you want open lines of communication. You want a clear vision for what you're doing. And you've, I'm sure you've worked in places. Maybe you haven't because you've worked for ESPN, which is a, a great place to work. But I've, uh, I've been a part of a bunch of teams where that, that connection is not very clear and the result on the field uh, suffers tremendously because of it. Where did you, where was it the best shared vision? Ooh, that's a great question. Um, I really, so obviously when Mike was here, I really enjoyed that. 2012 was a lot of fun. I think, you know, Mike's relationship to Kyle and Mike's relationship to Hazlitt were, were really fantastic. And I, again, were they the, were they the, the, the highest level of schematic innovation? No, but I think they were communicating their identities very, very well. 
the place that I enjoyed the most working uh, was probably in Atlanta with Dan Quinn. Um, you know, like from a head coaching standpoint, obviously my time in Chicago, because my position coach there was so fantastic, was awesome. But he did a good job of insulating us from a lot of the nonsense that was going on with the coordinator and the head coach, you know, so he did a good job of that. But um, but I think Dan, just from a, a work environment, did such a good job. And then even there, though, you know, because I was kind of I got there after they just replaced Kyle and they were kind of going through some changes. You could see, um, again, how while Dan had been able to maintain that great relationship with the team, the confidence in the coordinators had eroded a little bit and the communication from the coordinator to the player was eroding. So even though Dan had done a great job of maintaining this wonderful work environment, this 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 kind of motivating the players the X's and O's and the detail oriented nature of, of the offense and defense were, were, were changing pretty dramatically because that communication wasn't very clear. So as much as I enjoyed what Dan did there, it just shows you how important the coordinators are. Right. And I think, you know, that clearly led to his downfall there eventually. So when you're yeah. looking at, when you have a franchise that has a number two pick and most likely going to get a quarterback, yeah. how important, how important is it to get an offensive minded head coach? Is it? I think that's, that's that's a really good question. I don't I don't know. I don't know if it's that important, honestly, because again, they're more of a managing role. Obviously, if you're Kyle Shanahan, Sean McVay, um, the the Minnesota coach, who I always forget his name for some Kyle reason. Uh, if you're calling plays, it's important, and I think it's important because it lets you maintain a, a relationship and a continuity on on the offensive side of the football because you're always going to be there, right? But in turn, but if if you go out, I think Dan Quinn's first couple of years in Atlanta are brilliant example of this basically um you know he said i am going to handle the defense and that's gonna be my baby and i'm gonna have kyle shanahan right and he's gonna take care of that i think even when sean went to la that's a great example too because you hire wade phillips he does a great job getting you to a top five defense on that side of the football and that's him and that's his baby and it just shows you again that if you're going to be in a managing position like dan was in atlanta and you hire a great coordinator who can develop and encourage quarterback growth it doesn't matter uh, so I think if you can be as a defensive head coach or a special teams head, special teams kind of a uh, head coach who has a special teams background and say, I'm going to hire the correct person for this role, that's fine. I think then, then the next step becomes, and it becomes a little bit more complicated is because now you have to worry about who the, the succession plan for the offensive coordinator. Cause if you have any type of offensive success or success as a team, you're going to need to replace that individual pretty quickly. So I think that's where it becomes a little bit more complicated. Um, I don't think there's, you know, I think there's uh, some analytics that say offensive coaches tend to be more successful earlier on. I think there's, I think that's partially because there are more innovative coaches on that side, generally more innovative coaches on that side of the football. But I think when you look at uh, Dan Quinn's success in uh, in Dallas in terms of turning around the how bad they were when he first got there, when you look at McDonald's success in Detroit, they're or in uh, Baltimore, excuse me, they're they're doing incredibly innovative things defensively. They obviously understand at a high level the direction football is going. I like that that is the part of it, and it shows that they can make informed hires for offensive and defensive staff. So to me, not that important. But again, um, I think there is a recent precedent that probably biases people towards offensive coordinators, sure. uh, offensive and minded head coaches. I did want to ask you about McDonald because he also has a really good staff there too on defense. And yes. I, you know, it's yes. a very good staff. And again, that's, it, you know, when Greg Williams was here and Greg Williams was a very good defensive coordinator, but the best thing he did was hire that staff. I mean, that was a, an all-star staff that he yeah. had on defense. And it's what it's, it's pri the primary reason why, they executed so well, but let's go to McDonald in Baltimore. You talk about innovative stuff and he's always seemed to be someone who seems to be adaptable to his talent. What, yeah. what jumps out to you when you watch his defenses? I, I think the first thing that jumps out to me, same thing with Ben Johnson is just how talented they are. They've got a lot of guys that are really good at football. And then I think the next thing that jumps out to me is how detail oriented they are, how they have rules you know, for three by one, for two by two, they can kind of disguise coverages. They've communicated it well. The leverages are correct. And I think the other thing that jumps out is the blitz scheme. Like they just do a great job on third down, finding ways to create overload versus protection. And I think the other thing that sticks out to me is like I was watching a couple of clips last week of, um, of their game against uh, Houston. And one of the things that stuck out to me is like usually when you're dropping defensive linemen into coverage, uh, it gets a little bit um, weird because they don't know exactly what they're right. supposed to be doing, right? Because they're defensive linemen. And I just love that you're dropping these guys into coverage and they're not just dropping to spots. 
they're dropping with vision to number three to the receiving mm -hmm. side right and they understand that i got to close this window because that's where that's where i'm supposed to be replacing and i thought that just shows a level of detail oriented coaching from obviously the defensive coordinator but also anthony weaver that is unique right. to that style of blitz so i just i i think it's again it's good football they've got good football players but again you can tell they're well coached they're well executed again the timing of the blitzes how they're able to anticipate the snap count how they're able to create these patterns where they demand that offensive line. like you know like a lot of times oh we're gonna bring a safety off the edge or we're going to loop the defensive end and the defensive end loops a little bit too wide and the tackle can pass it off to the guard and pick up the pressure here. They run them nice and tight. The tackle can't pass it off. They can't leave their assignment. They can't leave the penetrator and you get free runners. So I just, I love that level of detail. It's the same thing you see with a Kyle Shanahan or Sean McVay led offense, the detail, the coaching, the, the precision of it. And I think that's really refreshing to see on the defensive side of the football. And I think that's one of the reasons it's special. And again, it's not only him, like you alluded to, it's the, they're very talented and they're very well coached. And that's not only him. That's all the position coaches that fall yeah. under his, uh, his purview. Their secondary coach, Jared Wilson is going to get looks as a, as a defensive coordinator candidate mm. in some places, I believe. I think he already is um, getting some looks at that or will. So, but it would, how much you when you watch that detail, how much of that was missing here? Um <laughs> yeah, so I think um I think a fair amount to be to be totally candid, right? I don't want to be, you know, kicking dirt on someone's grave sure. after they've left. But uh but yeah, it's 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 like watching something completely different. It's like watching a completely different brand of football. And um I think a lot of it stems from not having a, as much talent as maybe Baltimore does. And I same thing like when you watch Dallas, like Dallas is a very talented roster and they've got a very talented pass rush, but uh, Dan Quinn does a lot to maximize that group, just like McDonald does a lot to maximize what they're doing in Baltimore. And then it allows you to kind of coach the secondary in a specific way. And, um, and again, like it's not just them taking more chances because the pressure's there, it's them playing with excellent leverage, them knowing where their help is, them passing things off, them uh, communicating bunches, them understanding that I can hold this disguise because I've communicated with this player and you can, and it's not like, I'm just, I'm not like, I'm like a, you know, like predicting or anticipating or, you know, like reading between the tea leaves here. It's like, you can see them on film communicating right. in a way that you never saw here. And I don't think you ever had that kind of dy dynamic leadership or communication here that is needed to execute defense at a high level. And also you could just tell the detail from a coaching standpoint, wasn't always there, you know? And I, um, and I think that's uh, again, that's that, that person's gone at the moment, but I yeah. think uh, it, it negatively affected a lot of the players here on the roster as well. And then when you look at Detroit's defense, anything jump out? Cause I here's like Aaron Glenn is a candidate too. And, yeah. you know, and I think like when I talk, I know like the rankings of their defense, it's not going to impress anybody, but what I've always heard about him is it's the qualities that you described in a head coach people yeah. seem to think he has but just from you know i don't know what you know about him but also just the defense in general what you've seen from them well i think the thing for him that stuck out to me is they did that nfl pa poll recently yeah. where they graded um it was like they asked the players to grade people on the staff from like right. a likability leadership standpoint i think he was number two in the whole entire right. nfl yeah. so it's again it kind of speaks to what you're talking right. about there in terms of how how he um, understands and empathizes with players in addition to um, his leadership style and how he coaches. And when you watch them defensively, there's times you, you feel like they're a little bit outgunned, honestly, like they, they don't have the horses to get things done at a high level. But I also think that you see some defensive innovation there. You see some interesting blitzes. You see some interesting cover packages. It's just when I watch them in comparison to Baltimore, for example, the biggest difference I mean, I think there's a, a level of detail to the coaching that's missing in, in Detroit, but Detroit, uh, Bal or Baltimore, excuse me, is just incredibly talented at every level of the defense. And I think like, that's something that you go in and you say like, Oh, you know, this coach is great, but to be a good coach, you need good players. And so their defensive tackles are excellent. Their defensive ends are excellent. Their linebackers are excellent in Baltimore. Their corners are excellent. Their safeties are excellent. Their nickel players are excellent. And again, they're elevated by coaching, but also there are people that you would be happy to bring to certain organizations to elevate your talent. So I think that obviously they have a vision defensively in Baltimore for what they want to be, but I, I can't overstate just how good that group is from a personnel standpoint. And again, that's a credit to the GM there 
and their um and and how and how they process um you know free agency in the draft for example so well i wonder too with baltimore they're always good on defense and san francisco has been very good yeah. both those teams have really good linebackers too yeah and i when, just and, wonder like it's it's is that a position that for a few years maybe was undervalued and needs to be valued higher again well it's one of those things where i was pff they do such a great job in terms of their analytics where they were looking at um you know positions of value and so everyone i think always thinks offensive line quarterback receiver and i want to say outside of quarterback and left tackle the person that was most valuable to the team was the middle linebacker when the middle linebacker was playing at a high level right, right. so that's where you see your fred warners your roquan smiths your luke keekley's your ray lewis's those types of players um that are that are elevating not only themselves from their play but elevate the entire structure of the defense because so much of what offensive football is now is to attack that group attack the middle of the field put them in conflict make them fit runs make them have to defend the middle of the field there from a pass standpoint and so when you get a player that's elite an elite communicator an elite athlete an elite an elite instinctive player it of course elevates your defense i think i i think the, the value of a linebacker is something that has been devalued and I think rightfully so because it's hard to fill the position. But if you can find an elite linebacker to fill that role, it definitely 1,000% elevates your defense. It's just, it, to me, it just comes down kind of like to the quarterback. There's only five guys in the world that can do it at a high level. Can you find one of those five guys? And obviously, um, Baltimore and San Francisco have found those those types of players. So with <laughs> – Ben Johnson, though, let's get back to him because that offense, <laughs> I enjoy watching that offense. Yeah. And, you know, and I did, but I did want to talk about these other, some of these other coaches because you need it, people need to know. Um, with that offense, what do you think of it? And I mean, I enjoy watching it for whatever, yeah. whoever, whoever, for the whatever that's worth, but I'm curious what you think of it. Um, and then I'm going to get to quarterbacks in a second right after that. Yeah, I mean, I really enjoy watching that offense. And it's so hard for me to to believe that it's not related to that Mike Shanahan coaching tree. I think a lot of the same principles are there at a high level. We make we make everything look similar, right? Uh, you know, you don't know if we're running out of or passing out of these tight formations. Um, we find ways to make uh, our, our, our kind of home run stuff look different every single week, right? So, hey, we're going to run this deep dagger, right? How are we going to get to it? We're going to shift to it. We're going to motion. We're going to maybe use a different personnel grouping. I love that. I love that they have a very strong identity in running the football. Yeah. I think there's something to that from a psychology standpoint that I really appreciate, and it helps the play-action pass game quite a bit. I love that they've identified talented players from a roster construction standpoint, and then they've, they've developed players in-house. You know, they've... They've gone out and they drafted Williams from Alabama, who's made some explosive play for them, them, them this year. They've drafted Gibbs. They drafted Panay Sewell, but they've also developed, you know, Reynolds and St. Brown have come mm -hmm. along tremendously for them. And, and finding ways to maximize those skill sets, I think, is something that I really enjoy watching each and every week and just the creativity of it. And it's not like they're running. And again, it's not like they're running these innovative concepts that no one else in the NFL runs. If they run them like everybody else, they just get to them in different ways. And I think that's what makes it so special. And it's, it's the same stuff that Kyle does, same stuff that Sean does. And I think that's what makes those guys so brilliant. And it seems like he has a really good understanding of defensive football, honestly, too. And I, like in how he calls stuff and when he calls stuff and how he gets the bunches and how he manipulates rules and how he puts playmakers in good positions to make, make, make successful plays. So I really enjoy watching that offense. I really do. It's a lot of fun. And, uh, you know, it'd be nice to have a, a guy from that tree here hanging out, calling plays, you know, so. Well, you know, it's funny, too, because one of the things I always like with Kyle and Sean is the way they would set up plays, especially Kyle. Yes. And yeah. and I I see that ability with Ben Johnson, too. 100 percent. Yeah. And I think, again, it's just it's one of those things. It's like it's just good offensive football. Right. It's like we're going to run this run out of this tight split and we're going to make the safety have to think he's got to fit this run. And the next time we run it, you know, we're going to fake like we're going to crack the safety. We're going to run a post and it's going to be open for a touchdown. And it's and you can tell that that stuff is coached well. The receivers are coached well in terms of how they attack space. The quarterback does a great job of understanding when when a concept's dead or when he's going to push the ball down the field. And I think that just again, they're a very talented football team. They've been in the same offense for a long time. And that I think is the result of kind of that continuity, but also there is innovative stuff from an X's and O's uh, standpoint happening there for sure.
So when you're looking at, let's say, because the the only offensive coaches they're looking at right now that we know of are um, Ben Johnson, and then Bobby Sloak from Houston, who you brought yeah. up, who's mm-hmm. also part of that Kyle tree. And when you watch Houston, I th- when I watch Houston, I'm like, that's that's Kyle's <laughs> offense because you can see it, and it and it was and it's smart and it was great. Right. But um, so I'm curious though when you're watching those offenses and then you look at some of the quarterbacks in this draft, and I don't know how much you've studied them so far. Yeah. I know you've yeah. seen some of it, obviously, because we've talked about it. But, but I'm curious, like you know, when you're, if you're a Ben Johnson or Bobby Slug, whomever, whoever gets it, how much are you going to look at? Like this guy's just really good, or versus, and and I can mold them into this, or you know, I am going to have to change the offense, you know. And what do you what do you think of the quarterbacks? Whoops, <laughs> sorry, I get excited, fitting in this offense. Yeah, I think that's a really good question. And I think it's 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 important for people to understand that when you are doing draft evaluations, um, everything is a projection because there's such a drastic difference between the offensive structures in college and the offensive structures in the NFL and the expectation for the positions. Like even when you're watching receivers in some of these spread offenses, they'll run three routes. They'll run a post, they'll run a hitch, and they'll run a dig. And they won't run any other routes. So you've got to kind of extrapolate based on Little stuff you see, like we were talking about evaluating Ohio State receivers. Right. It's so hard to evaluate them in man-to-man coverage because they very rarely see man-to-man coverage, right? The allocation distribution of the field because of the width of the hashes changes the concepts they run, changes how defensive players can play stuff. So it, it's it, everything. everything's a projection. And so for me, I think what I'm looking at is I'm looking at who is the best football player on tape, right? Who is the best, most dynamic, most athletic football player that – if I were to get him, can make all the throws, throws with anticipation, has good accuracy, and has a playmaking moxie. And if you have those things, then that's something we can work on in the context of the offense. That's what the film gives you. Then I think the thing that fans and people need to understand is I need to know how this guy learns, how this guy leads. That's why, you know, Bo Nix going to the Senior Bowl is such a big deal. And I think he's going to come out of that process looking really, really good, maybe be a top 15 pick after he's done with the Senior Bowl. But, um, how does he lead, right? That's an opportunity for the coach to evaluate. That's why they go to the combine. The numbers and stuff are important, but it's really how you learn, how you lead, how you interact with the coaches. Do I like you? Because then I can say, you know, right, you know, maybe if I'm Ben Johnson, right? And I want to draft Daniels from LSU. I say, well, he hasn't been under center a lot, but I know based on how he works and how he approaches stuff that he can get to some more under, under center stuff as we go. Obviously, we have to tailor the offense to what he does well early on, but we can grow and mature in this offense, much like I think Lamar Jackson. I think they did a great job with his development up in Baltimore. They kind of tailored an offense around his skill set, and then now look at him. He can kind of do anything you want him to do from a pass game standpoint. And I think that's – you insulate a quarterback early by doing giving them stuff that they know well and they feel comfortable with, and then that that bucket expands. I think Jared Goff's another great example of that, right? Struggled early. Sean McVay had to insulate him in year two. Obviously, the trade happens. And then same thing happened with Ben Johnson in Detroit. What does he do well? Let's speak to that. And as and as he's gotten more comfortable, they've expanded what he does. Like if, initially when he got there, they didn't do a lot of play action pass. And then now when you watch their games, there's a significantly like higher, higher level of that happening because he's gotten more comfortable with that. So I think that's the way I would approach this. I'm saying, who's the most talented guy? Can he learn what we want him to learn? And then how do we kind of speak to what he does well now in the next two two years until we kind of let the offense grow and the personnel around him grow and blossom to create a a fantastic offensive product? How, how far along are you in just evaluating quarterbacks in this draft? So I've done, um, obviously I've watched all of them because like you're, I'm doing senior bowl guys. So like I've watched all the receivers, all the whatever. Um but in terms of like my actual evaluation on them, I haven't watched them in the level of detail. Some okay. of them, right? Like, so for example, um, I've watched a lot of Drake May because he has a couple of receivers and an offensive lineman that are going to the senior bowl. Um, I've watched a lot of Jane Daniels, watch a lot of Caleb Williams. Again, there's a lot of players from USC going out, but um, Joe Milton's a guy, the guy from Tulsa. I always forget his name, really like dynamic quarterback. Bo Nix, I've watched a fair amount. I haven't watched Penix that much, but kind of, there's five or six guys there that I feel like I have a pretty good handle on of, of who they are and what they're going to be. And, and I mean, obviously at two right now, you'd look at yeah. Drake may or Jaden Daniels. Yeah. And so for me at this moment, at right at this moment, and again, like subject it's gonna, to change, I'm guessing it's going to change a lot. It's going to change, but like I would go Daniels, I think. And, you know, we've talked about this a little bit over the last couple of weeks 
And, um, you know, obviously the players have good games and players have bad games and you got to kind of flesh out who the player actually is. But I just felt like the highs for Daniels this year were so much higher. And I feel vindicated in saying that because I think when you when you read stuff by Daniel Jeremiah, when you read stuff by Bucky Brooks, when you read the stuff at PFF, like he was a better football player this year, right? His his 2023 season was better. So if you're just looking at that film, it's really hard for me to say, oh, Drake May is a better football player, right? But again, like I said earlier, it's a projection business. So who projects better to the NFL? Right now, I don't think I could pass up on on Daniels because of what he did in 2023. But I think there's a lot of people that are going to say, Drake May, man, pretty good in 2022. Um, he's got a big arm, pretty good athlete. I don't see the accuracy that I want to see from him. I get a little bit nervous about it. But uh, again, I people are going to have their opinions. Right now, I'm pretty strongly in the Daniels camp because, again, he made some tight window throws, throw with, threw with some anticipation. There was a competitiveness there. I thought he got better as the year went on. Like you watch the Florida State game, you're like, man, don't love a lot of this because he's taking these big hits. He's <laughs> falling down. He's, you know, like it's, there's a lot of stuff, you know, he's, he's making ill-advised throws. He's not putting his receivers in good position to be successful. And then as you watch more games and specifically the Florida game and the, and the Alabama game, you're just like, these are good defenses. They're these, these defensive players will go high in the draft this year and he's making them look silly. So if he's got that kind of athletic ability, I just don't think I feel comfortable passing on him at two, if he's available. The good thing is, Logan, people will take your comments about the quarterbacks very rationally, and there will not be anybody saying, like, that's why he didn't play the position. That's why he didn't do this. So that's the good thing about quarterbacks. It's what I yeah. love about this. <laughs> yeah, no, it's great. And, and, I, then, and, I, and, I, and I acknowledge, like, um, I acknowledge that, like, everyone's going to have a little different opinion. I think that's the yeah. thing that's important to remember about the draft is everyone's going to have a little different opinion. Like, I talked to – I'll talk to Grant Paulson. He's a – you know, he's a Drake May guy through and through. He loves what he sees from Drake May. Uh, one of the, one of our producers on the other show that I work on loves Drake May. I just, again, if you're basing it on 2023, he was a better football player. The throws were tougher. The, the, the level of difficulty was, was kind of more NFL ready and detractors of him will say, Hey, he's throwing to Malik neighbors. He's throwing to Brian Thomas. Both of those guys are going to be first round players. I'm totally with that. That's a hundred percent, but so was Joe Burrow. Right? right. And then you say, Oh, what about, um, you know, he, he he wasn't good at Arizona State. He was just kind of a fourth-round player. I'm with that as well. But I also like to see players that develop. And I think that's another reason I'm a little bit higher on Bo Nix, too, right now, is because they've developed. They've played a lot of football. They've seen different offenses. They've learned different offenses. And I think there's a lot of value there. So, and again, I, this is not a knock on track. I just think it's really hard to evaluate yeah, quarterbacks coming out of that North Carolina offense, too. So, it is. You know. It is. And, and the, you know, the last thing I'll say on the quarterbacks, too, like, when I talk to people, it's all over the place. So, yeah. you know, and it doesn't mean that. And because someone, if if they like quarterback X and you say something bad about quarterback X, you're or whatever. However, yeah. I'm hearing the same discrepancies within NFL circles. Yes. So like, people in the game are going to be different. You know, the other thing is too, and this, and I don't know, like I have no clue that they would even go down this road because it'd be very expensive but a guy that I think would fit this off like a Ben Johnson offense very right. well, or even Kirk cousins. It. There you go. Kirk cousins, man. Yeah. I'm with that hundred percent. Like talking about, not a say, guy and I'm not saying they should, but I'm just saying like, it's, I mean, he would fit. He would, he would fit. Excellent. Doesn't mean they should. Job. Yeah. It doesn't mean they should. Doesn't mean they should pay him. But yeah, if you're looking right. for fits for the offense, like he's been in a version of this offense the yeah. last couple of years in Minnesota. So it makes a ton of sense to me. And, yeah. um, you know, speaking to the the variance of, of quarterbacks, like Caleb Williams has been kind of the definitive number one. Right. I talked to a guy yesterday who said he thinks Daniels is the number one quarterback in the draft mm -hmm. and Caleb Williams is number two. So there it really is beauties in the eye of the beholder. And yep. that's why a guy, like Adam Peters for the commanders is so important because he has a great eye for talent. He has yeah. a great eye for distilling information and communicating with the coach and making informed decisions about the vision of the roster. So that's why that guy gets paid a lot more money than I get paid. And you get paid, John, because he's done it for a long time yep. and makes good decisions. So uh, I'm going to defer to what ultimately his judgment says, but as of right now, if Logan Paulson was the GM uh, until like uh, all my little underlings told me differently, we'd be leaning towards Daniels in the, dra in the draft this year. And, you know, the beauty for what I do is I can tell you why they should draft player X and sound smart. And then when they draft a different player, I can talk about him and sound smart too. So you know, that's, <laughs> it's a beauty of being on this end of the, 
uh, of the of the of the microphone, I guess. And you know, that's it's what I enjoy. But I mean, it is a crapshoot. And it, I remember one time talking to um, a personnel guy here, and you know, I used to do these ratings things or whatever, or you analyze after games. And he said, he always said to me, he's like, oh yeah, I read your thing. I said, what'd you think? He goes, it's like he goes, half the people here would agree and half would disagree. Because he's like, that's just how it is here. Like right, everybody right. is going to see something that jumps out to them. And right. then you're going to say like, I really like this aspect of Daniel's game or Drake May's game or Caleb, whatever, whomever it is. And, and then go from there. John, I got a perfect example for you. So I, I have a, I have an affinity for people that like break the system. Right. So like Johnny Wilson, the receiver from Florida state, mm -hmm. like I just cannot stop watching this film. Cause I'm like, oh man, look at how he moves. Look at how he bends in and out of his breaks. Oh, look at the the, the subtle stems that he brings, right? And um, and so I'm like really excited about him. I'm like, oh, he doesn't catch the ball super consistently. That's okay, we can get him there. But if it's another receiver, I'm like, oh, he doesn't catch the ball well. I don't want right. to like he's got to. Right. And it's just it's funny how you get like in these like love circles with players, and you're willing to ignore some of their warts um, in favor of in favor of the high qualities you see. So. Uh, again, it's that's why I think it's so important for for the GM position to have people that he trusts around him yeah. and be able to distill that information because it's a, and and the other thing it's, it's so important is does the coach like him does the right. coach get along with him does the coach make it happen because if I'm invested in this guy as a coach and I think he's got something to him I'm going to be willing to work through some of the bumps as opposed to throwing it away right first opportunity so I think. I think that's going to be so critical is whoever they do hire as head coach, whoever they do hire as the OC, hopefully I think they will get a lot of input and they'll be able to make a decision that's best for this organization, even though it might not fit with my evaluation of the talent at the moment. There you go. And there've been a lot of times in the past where they'd sign guys where it was like the coach, like, why did you sign this guy for me? <laughs> You know, and Jay Gruden can talk about that for probably yeah. a couple hours. So it, yeah. and it's and it never ends well in those situations. So right. um, anyway, Logan, you're the best. Appreciate it. Tell people where they can find you. I brought up Take Command with Craig Hoffman. Yeah. Where, yeah. where else? Take Command and then the, the Command Center podcast, which is through the team. We do that with Fred and right. Santana. That's been really great. We have uh, all that content there on the YouTube page. So make sure you guys check that out. My Instagram, Logan underscore Paulson82. And like you said, the Take Command podcast. So. There you go. And where Craig is nice enough to give you a chance to talk once in a while. <laughs> he does. He's very good about it. I love, I love Craig. It. I just kid him. So anyway, <laughs> thanks, Logan. Thanks, John. That's it for this episode. Thanks to Logan for joining me. And thank you, as always, for tuning in. I'll be back on Monday morning with another episode talking coaches, talking, hey, What's going on in Philadelphia with the Eagles? Is there an opening for other teams in the division? Are they really slipping? What's going on? Going to check in on them as well. But I have a lot, a smorgasbord of stuff. Got the Senior Bowl coming up next week. A lot to talk about, folks. Possibly a new coach very soon. Talk to you next time.